What is up, everybody? Happy Wednesday. I hope you're doing well. I hope you're safe. Hope your hands are clean. I know that things are so tough right now. So many businesses that are listening to this, so many photographers simply will not survive this craziness. And I just wanted to say, I hear you. I see you. I love you. We're here for you. I... I, this is going to sound salesy, but I don't want it to be. We have a free Facebook group that I would love for you to join where people are talking about how things are going for them, what they're doing in advance, what they're trying to do, what they're trying to figure out, how they're rescheduling, contracts, money, all that stuff. To go there, it's just togfb.com, T-O-G-F-B.com. Also, too, if you're trying to figure out what you can work on during this time, we're going to do a Facebook ads workshop on June 9th at 7.30 p.m. EST with Max Sadiq, who you've had on the podcast before. You've heard him before. He's a Facebook ads expert. He works for Lindsey Roman and Every Rupp and Devin Robinson on all their courses, all their Facebook ads. Maddie May, like Adventure It Said, she, he's like just an incredible, incredible ads guy. So definitely come check out the Facebook group, togfb.com. Don't miss the Facebook ads workshop. It's going to be June 9th, 7.30 p.m. EST. Would love to have you there. And let's just get into it with our wonderful guest, Andre, who I absolutely, absolutely love. Here we go. Andre, so excited to have you on the podcast, man. It's it's, uh, it's been a long time coming, and uh, thanks for being here, man. Listen, man, I did trim my beard yesterday, but I want you to know that I left some of it in honor of the, <laughs> the namesake of this podcast. <laughs> that that is, uh, <laughs> and I also appreciate anyone that uses Calendly. So thank you for yeah. <laughs> you know making literally making time to have me on like six months in advance. Um, <laughs> And especially in this time when we're all holed up and hoping to not die, it's good to do something. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. That's <laughs> that's interesting. That's exactly. Uh, I had uh, had your good buddy Anisha on, and uh, she was just like, "Thanks for not asking me any questions about uh, you know coronavirus and how it's affecting my work." That was lovely. I was like, "I got you, fam. I got you." <laughs> uh, but cool, man. So uh, you can hear me all right. Everything's feeling good. Absolutely awesome. So I wanna, I just wanna hop right in. I know. Uh, I heard of you at uh, this workshop in Brooklyn, uh, ironically called Brooklyn, or called Workshop, not Brooklyn. Uh, that would be cool, though, too. And uh, and it was... Mo- Wait, were you at Workshop? Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, man, Workshop. I remember when they first reached out to me, they were like, do you want to wor- speak at Workshop? And I was like, well, what is this? Yeah. <laughs> well, it was cool. And- <laughs> they called, Someone called me on the phone. I was like, hello? Oh, that's kind of <laughs> fun. That's awesome. Uh, it was kind of fun because, you know, and I think I was talking to Anisha about this. I liked the idea that you know it it felt like primarily you know wedding or couple photographers or whatever but at the same time they pulled in a few people that were just specialists in something else that could offer perspective and uh, or just people who were in new york and uh just kind of like building the community and you know i just feel like revealing and uh and you were one of those people and i was like oh this guy's really cool and seems really fun and his work is awesome and um and then i know we've been kind of back and forth chatting uh over various different things over the last year since uh big things have been happening for you. And then I asked you for, for advice. So, um, this is all just to say, I'm, yeah, I'm glad we made this happen. We made it happen. Um, <laughs> so I just want to get right into it. I want to know, uh, I, w- I was researching you a little bit and I was already like a fan, obviously, like I wouldn't have asked you to, to come on if, if I didn't think you were awesome, but, um, wow, there is now evidence on the internet that someone is the fan of mine. Yeah. You can put this in your date, your, huge. your dating profile and be like, Hey, a, a large, a fat white bearded dude <laughs> thinks I'm awesome. And it's not Santa. Um, but, uh, I was reading something. First of all, we don't call each other fat here. Listen, man. <laughs> Especially right now. No, 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 no. We don't talk about ourselves that yeah. way. Keep going though. Yeah. I'm on the, on the quarantine <laughs> diet. No. Um, uh, so, <laughs> so I was reading and, uh, you know, I was like doing some research. I was like, okay, yeah, what, okay, I, I feel like I have a good gauge of what's going on. And then um, and out of nowhere, you referenced a quote from uh, a buddy of mine, John Foreman. And I was like, this is my guy. I was like, this is my guy. <laughs> Oh, John Foreman's a friend of yours? Uh, so we're, we're acquaintances. I was the, the tour photographer for Switchfoot uh, oh, what? back oh. in the day. And uh, we were on the road together for a while. And then I've shot some of his like solo shows and stuff with Sean Watkins as well. So, uh, Oh, man. Yeah. Let's take a tiny second to 
jump into that. What <laughs> quote? What did I say about John Foreman? Oh crap! Now I gotta I gotta you know, think about it. It was something about uh, uh, I'm gonna look it up live right here on the podcast. I don't even care. Uh, I'll just I'll take this time to ask you a quick second. Is uh, is your last name Laro or Laro? Uh, Laro. Laro. Um, dang it! A third option. Fun fact. So no, it's okay. I, I have a, I've actually never met my dad before, and I have my dad's last name. Um, and I grew up, you know, with a single parent being my mom. Sure. So I technically don't actually know how to say it, but I Googled it when I was like 14. <laughs> and according to the internet, it is Laura from the French to mean of royalty. Oh. So we'll go with that. Okay. Yeah. It's probably like in the French spelling, it had like the, the E-A-U-U-X kind of spelling or something like that. Ex- that's exactly how okay. it was. Okay. Yep. That makes perfect sense. That's awesome. But you said, uh, you said this about John Foreman or his quote, and it said, experience is all I have. I equate songwriting and archaeology. Every day you dig, you dig into different places within yourself, even finding places that you've rarely been and buried within the soil is song. Uh, and so, yeah, dude, I saw that. And I was like, okay, this is my guy. This is this is confirmation. Yeah, you know what? I I always strive when I do podcasts to talk about something I haven't talked about before. So let's talk about this legitimately. Um, I one of the first ways that I got into photography, like in the abstract, was actually being a youth group kid. Mm, it was yeah. <clears throat> actually because I really, really loved Switchfoot as like a late middle schooler. I think the beautiful letdown came out in what, 2004, Uh 2003. And I was in middle school until 2005. So the first three albums I owned were the beautiful letdown, Kanye West college dropout and the black album by Jay Z. And I, (laughs) I think now like some, some Switchfoot for me has, I, um, I, don't love it as much, sure. but there are some that still really hits me. Like happy is a yuppie word. I was listening to the other day. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot of appreciation of artistry. And I think especially as a younger kid, my mom was all about experience, like I said before. And so she would, you know, figure out ways to get me to all sorts of things like little art camps and things like that. Mm. And I was always kind of spatially challenged. So I would kind of struggle to freehand draw and like paint and it wasn't like horrible, but it wasn't good. And I was frustrated because I, I had an idea of what I wanted and I couldn't get there. And so <clears throat> I really gravitated toward photography when I started to, and I got the nothing is sound like the Lux pack you know, when you're like, <laughs> you save your money, so it's like $45. And um, I remember getting this photo book that was shot by Andy Barron, who's a photographer I really, really yeah, like. Yeah, he's been a guest on the podcast. Him a couple years ago. He- um, <clears throat> and I would just say that so often the love of music and especially the artistry and then how open I think um, a lot of those early Switchfoot albums were. Um, and even like, I don't know what counts as early. I'm, I'm talking like all the way up to Oh Gravity, Hello Hurricane. So I don't really know if that's early anymore, but a lot of those for me, the process of like studying them, like you do when you're 12 and 16, where you're like, I love this. I'm listening to it a thousand times. Um, <clears throat> gave me a couple of the initial keys, I think to like really get as, as anal about my work itself. And in the most like not shameful plug, it would mean the world to me if you could just be like, Hey, I met this guy. And he said that you influence his artistry. Please tell John Foreman that. Cause I very much mean that. Um, learning how to die is a song that I thought a lot about about a year ago. I was uh, hiking with my friends through the wave on a photo trip for Alma car and told a woman that meant a lot to me as a kid. Um, she was a youth group leader of mine just abruptly died. And I spent that day really kind of honoring her in that space. And that song came to mind. Um, so I think often <clears throat> for me, a love of some art led to finally kind of getting to this point where I can make something that I think mm. um, is reflective of my vision or part of it. Yeah. No, hundred percent. That's awesome, dude. I appreciate it. This is great. This is, uh, I love chatting about things that like you've never chatted before about on a podcast or interviews. Um, and Andy Barron too. Uh, he's episode ten on this on this podcast. He's a, a big hero of mine. Uh, love that guy. Um, yeah, I think um, you know a lot of people get started. Uh, at least, like I feel like your story resonates a lot with people we've had on here, even myself, of like uh, single parent and um, you know trying to find ourselves in these like artistic places and uh, just finding trying to see where where do we fit in that thing and so like you had your three albums right you know kanye jay-z and switchfoot a different mix and and everybody else had their three or five albums and that was like shaping them along this time you know if it makes sense and um you know and and even though we don't equate probably probably don't feel the same way about uh 
maybe our intentions at that time that we do that we have uh it's like we we were shaped by that 100 percent, right and it, it probably could just comes out in like who you are and your work for sure no i mean totally i think um if we talk about it um in the concept of work shaping like uh, i wrote this piece a couple years ago for the well it was a facebook post actually and uh the summer before i had interned at the chicago reader um and it was a 10-year anniversary of kanye um what it meant mm. i'm actually gonna google it to see if i can uh sound smart but <clears throat> for me i kind of wrote about what kanye meant to me at that time um and i can actually drop it in the in the in the zoom chat so you can see it but like for me i spent a lot of time listening and paying attention and really studying the artists that like i was lucky to have cds of like listen to them mm. before school in the morning and um i my whole life went to magnet schools so school's not in my neighborhood so i actually spent a lot of time on buses and just in transit so lots of repeating of albums um <clears throat> and like I said, <laughs> fear of opening up and being vulnerable would keep the necessary kind of music away from the ears of little brown boys and girls who know that their blend of African American culture, we know that they have to be in, the, in their blend of African American culture in a white dominated society. And the concept is like, or of writing this was talking about like Kanye's <laughs> supreme arrogance mixed with an incredible artistry mm. and what impact that definitely had on me as a younger person and like uh what it even has on me now and how you even mix that with a concept and sense of place of switchfoot and how those two aren't as far as away away as you think mm. um <clears throat> so i would say that those two albums shaped a lot of my work like i think now um i was really proud when i read something john foreman had written a couple years ago for the huffington post about being aware of like white privilege yeah and it was fascinated by all the people being so angry with him for saying that um <clears throat> but it's important to me as like, you know, going to switch with shows as a high school or being one of the only black people there and realizing at that point, not realizing that I'm in a space that was for certain people. Mm. <clears throat> and then now trying to figure out where I sit in that space, how I exist in it um, and how I can both like continue to grow, be proud of myself and understand parts that have influenced me. Um, so that's what I mean. It's just like, um, I, I try to have my work have a lot of thoughtfulness to it. And especially things I share on the internet, I try really hard to kind of speak to that duality. Is there, <laughs> does that mean when you think about that, are you, you know, kind of in that, that space where you, you don't want to share anything unless it has that deep meaning or, or there sometimes you're just like, Hey, I took this and I like it. Like what's your, what's kind of a uh, Andre's like, Mm, gauge or bound that's tricky boundary. yeah <clears throat> i don't know if there's a boundary i think <laughs> there's stuff i like and if i like it and i think it's beautiful i'm gonna share it um there's stuff that i believe needs to be shared and to this day i sh i'll sh like i have no idea what people are gonna like i don't know why i'm so bad at this <laughs> like <laughs> i posted this like okay that's not true i took a photo that I shared of that boy in Miami with the dogs. And that photo meant so much to me because um, <clears throat> it's actually like an inspired photo by a Jonathan Man Mannion photo of DMX um, with these kind of pit bulls on a leash, but it was very Miami because it was down is downtown Miami from South Florida where I'm from. Yeah. And so I shared that and this other piece um, from, yeah, from Birmingham that were pieces that I turned in for a Walmart project. Now it worked out well because the Walmart project did well. I got to share the video and then you kind of saw the ones that, you know, not corporate chill, but the things that Walmart was happy with that made it for the commercial. And then I got to share things that I liked. So <clears throat> it was a weird mix of, I am, first of all, I'm not going to make any digital proclamations that make you believe that I am um, just doing whatever I want, because I don't think that does anyone a good service, but also on the other end, not just sharing things that essentially act as advertising for other people. And so trying to figure out, <clears throat> you know, what work did I do? How did it frame my like way of thinking? Mm. Um, and then what did I, could I take away from it? So if you, if you scroll down a little bit on my Instagram, there's a picture of a young boy on a, um, standing next to his purple bicycle. <laughs> that the day I shot, that was funny. I was shooting my first billboard. I shot a billboard ad for, or like a big ad for Coors Light. Yeah. 
about black people, about black people drinking cores and <laughs> you will not find any of that on my feed, not because it's necessarily bad. It just doesn't super fit. But <laughs> for me, it's honoring that day by posting this photo of this boy that was biking around as we were shooting throughout the day. And toward the end of the day, I just took a photo on my phone and he was really sweet. Um, and it just kind of exists. So for me, uh, first of all, I enjoy, someone tweeted this a long time ago that Twitter is my Finsta and I fully agree. Like on Twitter, I'm just gonna say wild stuff and share more things. Um, and then on Instagram, I think that <clears throat> stories has allowed me to like engage with people more. And like I can share things that like later someone might be like, this is incredible and I can share it on my feed, which I think has allowed my feed to be <clears throat> less sacred in a way. Like I can share more things. If it doesn't work, I just kind of take it down. Um, but whenever I do a project, I think it's cool. I always try to share a couple things from it because I think that like the immersion of the project is more important than the single post Mm. (laughs) because I'm both trying to say, I did this cool thing, hire me again. And I'm trying to say, Hey, you can also do this cool thing. This is how I did it. Um, and I'm just trying to honor that memory and like hold it for myself. as like a digital yearbook. Sure. Yeah. You, it's like, um, yeah, it's multifaceted. You want to keep the the positive memories, hopefully, or just the memories in general and, and record. But at the same time, like, you know, you're creating, you know, work, you know, things that are going to pay the bills uh, for somebody else. And, you know, when it when it does align with like you and your values and um and hopefully, yeah, I, I get, I've been following you for, for about two years now. And it's like, that's definitely what I feel like. And and the kid with the bicycle is a good example of just like, you know, Hey, uh, you know, I might not want to share anything from this job. And, and the same thing happens to me. Like I, I never share a lot of my corporate work, but, uh, you know, so that, like I was in Tampa two weeks ago, Tampa, shout out to Florida, yeah. uh, <laughs> shout out to the fine state. Yeah. I will accept no Florida slander. <laughs> I will not. Tampa was lovely. I mean, I had never been, and it was uh, it was great. And uh, I grew up deep sea fishing in the Keys often, so I, you know, I'm a fan of Florida. Um, mostly conch fritters, but um, yeah, we I shot this event, and then I was kind of like walking around the space, just trying to see what was around, and just try to you know get context that they would like. And uh, the Tampa Convention Center is like pink and blue, and I was like, I just love these colors, and so I just went straight up and. Uh, you know, just shot kind of like little details and try to just do something that like wasn't, uh, you know, in my normal wheelhouse. And I, I usually photograph people and um, it uh, it was just nice. It was just a nice thing. And so that's what I shared. I didn't share anything about the event uh, that I was shooting or any of the client's work or anything like that that I made for them. But just like, hey, I think this, uh, this side of the Tampa Convention Center looks really cool. And here are the colors. And, um, mm. you know, and it's just um, I love that kind of like there there is something to you know, what will you remember about this particular piece of work, even if it's not the work. And sometimes it's, you know, it's that boy by the bicycle and you've just got your phone and you're like, all right, here we go. Whereas like the day before you're on set with, you know, lights and people and everything. And, you know, it's, it's this big deal. Um, I want to know what is it like for photographers who, who know who you are or, or people coming from like the wedding event world or even headshot world, like, um, what is it like, uh, as much as you can feel comfortable sharing, uh, what's it like working with an agent as a photographer or as a creative, like, um, even like just functionally, how does that process work or, uh, you know, for you and, and has that, what was different from before you had an agent? I'm just curious. curious. Um, oh yeah, I'm happy to share. So honestly, man, I don't really know, fully know what's going on and (laughs) The th- there's a couple times when I'll say this, Jesse has been very steady handed. Mm. Um, I mean, I've done some dumb stuff and I'd like should listen to people better. I don't always listen that well, but like, <clears throat> I remember a year or two ago, there was a client that wanted to shoot me to shoot something. Um, and they came with like an absurdly no nut low number. They needed me to shoot like a video that was going to be like really long. Mm. Like I think like well over, it might've been 20 minutes or 10 minutes or some, something like that. It was like over, it was a long amount, okay. of, amount of stuff. Yeah. And the number they were like, we can pay you like $2,000. Mm. I was like, what? <laughs> like not even in a bad way. Like this is like a full product video for you. It's going to be a lot of work. Um, and I remember just kind of being like, Hey dude, like this is kind of weird. Right. And he's like, yeah, I know this is ridiculous. Um, and you know, at first I was really worried when we started that, um, I was going to like 
anyone that replied to me, he'd be like, not enough money, pay him $40,000. Yeah. Um, but I mean, honestly, I don't really have that problem. Like we talked early and I just told him like, yo, I'm happy to do whatever he will weigh in and be like, yo, that's a bad idea or that's too low or like, Hey, that's good. You need to like, just kind of knowing when the, the ceiling of negotiating happens, mm. because there's times when you, I remember, uh, I mean, I remember a couple years ago, probably not six years ago, probably four years ago, I did a project four and a half. I did a project for a, like a major ish clothing brand and they paid me $200 um, to make some social content for them. But I had to like get models and shoot three times. Oh wow. And I don't even know why I said yes to that. And I remember thinking like now I'm like, yo, they own those photos forever. Like, why did I do that? Um, and sometimes you think like, <laughs> like even more than having like a big brother behind you or something like that. I just like the process of talking to someone that, has done things longer than me. Mm. Um, and generally, in my opinion, the jobs that I'm getting for my agent are ones that I didn't have access to before, Sure, which is things I think a lot of people like the course thing I did last year, the, um, the Walmart thing came in through some Avenue that, uh, that Jesse gave to me. Um, and just a couple things that like, I just did not have access to. And in the process of even being aware of those things, I've learned a lot. Um, I think that the process is mostly like, it's particularly helpful when you get a request where you're like, yo, I don't even know what this is, like what to do with this. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but then again, it's also nice. Like right now in the middle of this crisis and coronavirus, lots of, lots of pausing, a lot of um, interruptions, cancellations. And, you know, we just had a, a work order come in or a PO come in yesterday. And he was like, look, dude, I think the terms are good. We should just take it. Cause right now, like we don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. And no one is prepared for this. He's like, I've never seen anything like this. No one has. And so be as prepared as you can also like take care of yourself. Um, and my point about the client originally with the video was at one point the budget was just too low and I was like, I don't want to do it. And he's like, yeah, don't do it. Um, which is big because when someone can tell you, cause he 25% of my money, um, of the money that comes in through a job, um, goes to the agent they take. Yeah. And so <clears throat> for someone to say like, yo, <laughs> me, for me to directly cost somebody money and then to be like, this is a bad idea is enough for me to trust that they have my more my best interest in mind than people commonly do. Mm. Um, for me, generally, I don't really like messing with people. People mess with money. Like it's just like a like just personally, I don't really like love um, avenues, thing roadblocks between me and what I need to do. But I don't feel that that is the case here. Um, <clears throat> and for me, also, a lot of the people are, that are in this agency are very very kind, including Jesse. They've been very kind to me earlier in my career, like Tyson Wheatley, Chris Ozer, Jessica Zalman. Paul Octavius, uh, Paul Octavius, I met when I was in Chicago as at, at the reader as an intern and he was collaborating with them on their best of Chicago issue. And I just met him. Um, and I remember he just told me like every opportunity I was 20, 20 years old. He said, every opportunity you get to be creative, take it and be really intentional about it. Mm. I remember that conversation hella well. And I think it was when I started to take like the concept of Instagram seriously. So I would just say like from a long time ago, I've always like really appreciated um, kind of the, the walk and the talk of the people that I now get to call like colleagues. Yeah. <clears throat> no, a hundred percent. It's, it's, uh, it's good when <laughs> it's good when you meet your heroes and they tell you not to meet your heroes, but it's okay when your heroes are, are awesome. <laughs> Hey guys, want to hop in here and just want to thank our first sponsor. That's Tave. Tave is my everything. I use it to manage my entire photography business from mentorship to weddings, to engagements, to portraits, to corporate work, to whatever. I know lots of photographers and my mentees who use it for boudoir, for video, for corporate. It is the photographer's best friend, super affordable, and it's just a way to kind of manage all that icky business stuff, right? So like your invoices, your quotes, your payments, proposals, uh, all your galleries, emails and scheduling. So like they have pre-made templates for you to use. So it's just really packed with value, which is really, really cool. It even handles like my second photographer contracts or associates or producer contracts. And it's just been wonderful the past three years to use this software. And the team's really great. The support people are really great because, you know, a lot of this is new for all of us. And I love Tave. I manage over 60 clients a year with them, and even as we grow the Mesa Photography team, it's making it super easy to make sure every single client, is, I'm touching base with them, we're having contact with them, and they have the luxury experience that we want them to have. Uh, one of my favorite features of Tave is their booking reports, so you can track all your inquiries, how they found you, of course, how much you got paid, and this just helps you kind of plan and know where to put your time and effort, You know, whether that's Facebook ads or SEO or word of mouth or whatever, you can kind of see the gamut of where that data is coming from. 
I've used Tave for years now and it's changed my business forever. I don't ever want to leave. Uh, whether you're a wedding photographer, videographer, headshot guru, or boudoir master, Tave can work for you. Now, we're going to give you a special deal as Bearded Talk listeners only. You can get 60 days for a free trial instead of their normal 30 days just for being a listener. So, we're going to let you guys set up your Tave for two months. And if you don't love it, then. I don't know what's wrong with you, but seriously, DM me if you want help. We've got lots of time on our hands. Uh, head to thebeardedtalk.com slash Tave to sign up. Get your extra special 60-day free trial today. That's thebeardedtalk.com slash T-A-V-E and try out Tave and get your life back today. Thanks for Tave for sponsoring our show. I mean, look, people are going to disappoint you, man. Yeah. Everyone will. Um, people don't, like, you're not, in in my mind, I'm the most important person in the universe. In your mind, you are. We can try, do our best to fight that, but at some point, the the goals that we have will diverge from other people's and sometimes it's in a nefarious way. And sometimes it's just kind of banal. Um, and so just recognizing that someone can be special and they could have inspired you. And that part is important and holding on to that is key. Like, I'm not saying now that I'm like a secret R Kelly fan, like, no, <laughs> like, no, he's <laughs> it, like, he's done. Like, I don't care about no music is that good. Um, but on a, on a small, small level, like, you know, People can inspire you. They can mean something to you. And it's just so you keep moving. I love it. I love it. I want to know, uh, you know, do you think your life would be the same that it is now um, without uh, without your high school teacher ever giving you a camera or like, you know, making that exchange? It's funny. Another one of my high school teachers used to always tell me she thought that I should um, like host a daily show. That was her thing. Mm. She was like so confident that my like i don't know whether it was the wit or the sheer attitude was perfect for uh making fun of people for a living um which was always i appreciated the compliment i did high school theater but i was not good at it so i don't know like i think when i was in college when i was graduating i were thinking like what kind of like design class i probably should have been a designer or like maybe i should have tried to do advertising i think the concept of Advertising in itself can be rough, but the concept of finding a value proposition, translating to somebody so that they can purchase it is still pretty good to me. Um, I also love the concept of, I love journalists. Um, I think Wirecutter is amazing. Shout out to Wirecutter. Yeah. As, since I'm going to move apartments soon, I appreciate them for helping me find my greatest laundry hamper. <laughs> this is not sponsored, but Wirecutter, come at me. Um, but yeah, basically, like uh, I think something in the realm of uh, visual communication. So whether that's through advertising design or some sort of journalism would have been interesting to me. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think the reason why the camera was important was sometimes it's just the the physical hurdle and the financial hurdle of, of getting something immediately. Yeah. And so having my teacher provide that was really helpful. Sure. Yeah. I think it's one of those things where, um, so you grew up in Florida, right. And then did the magnet schools there. Yeah. 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 So I grew up in Fort Lauderdale. Um, North Lauderdale to be exact for my nine five fours out there. And so when I was in elementary school, we first like moved from Jamaica and I went to preschool. Then I went to elementary school. I went to uh, plantation elementary, I think, um, or plantation park, one of the two. So that one was near my neighborhood. We used to be able to walk, but the minute we moved into the house, my mom still lives. Then I went to Maplewood, um, which was several miles away. Like I couldn't walk there. Mm. It would take me hours. Sure. Um, but it was honestly only like a 15 minute drive, but you've been to Florida. So, you know, like a 15 minute drive, it could be like eight miles. Yeah. <laughs> and if you're like six, you know, so, um, <laughs> did that. And then in high school, a uh, middle school, I went to Sawgrass, uh, Springs, which was hella far. That was like a 30 minute drive from my house. So I don't even know how that would have worked. Yeah. And then in high school, I went to Deerfield beach high school, which was 40 minutes the other direction. Dang. Um, and so I think that's why when I first moved here, the idea of being in transit didn't really bother me that much versus like other people I know, like Lid, uh, my girlfriend goes to, or when she went to high school, she would just walk like across the street and like another street in her high school was like six minutes away. And I was like, this is crazy. But she also lives in Delaware. So, you know, it's not real estate. Yeah. What? Um, okay. So we have to trade. If, uh, if, <laughs> if we can't make fun of Florida, you can't make fun of Delaware, bro. I'm, I'm from Delaware. So I'm, I'm just, naturally, I'm just kidding. I love Delaware. Yeah, 302, man. Lewis, Delaware <laughs> is my 15th home. That's where I was born, Jonathan man. Miller's. <laughs> you were born in Lewis, Delaware? Yeah, man. BB hospital. Are you serious? I've driven by the hospital 4,000 times. <laughs> are you, you're for real. You were born in Lewis hospital? 100%. My, my parents are right there right now. Well, not at the hospital in that Delaware. In Southern Delaware, so funny. Yeah, man. That means that we've probably been. 
I've been there when you've been there. I've been going there for a while now. That's awesome. Big fan. Okay. Big Lewis Delaware fan. Yeah, dude. That'll going to the lavender farm, getting ice cream from that gross place with the with the cows, <laughs> going to the Nike outlet. Yeah, the Nike outlet is like the you know game changer. Uh going to the beach, going to dogfish head. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> that is hilarious. <laughs> so yeah, it's a real state. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but I, I was gonna ask. So I want to know with all those schools and that kind of stuff, like you know, and being, and I, I'm not afraid of this. We talk about this all the time on the podcast, but like being, being a black man or a man of color in uh, the U S like, do you think that camera was like a, a leg up or I think you, you kind of said like it, it afforded you an opportunity that might've taken longer for you to pursue in general because of your background or because of, you know, just like growing up single family household. Hmm. Um, well, okay. Let me, let's start it this way. And that makes my mom particularly special is that she is a remarkably dedicated person that is a big believer in putting in the work. And so, <clears throat> you know, in her perfect world, I would have been like an engineer or a lawyer or something. Um, and, but all those things I think for her were even less about prestige, but about <clears throat> putting, having me do something that put me through rigors, that then allowed me to like immediately see fruits of my labor. Mm. Um, I think that the, the things that would be like disenfranchising to me were more like, I mean, like I would be like one of the first times I drove, I was driving one of my friends home after a church car wash and our shirts were wet. So we took our shirts off in the car. And the minute we took our shirts off, the police pulled us over wow. and we're like, Hey, we're being some people that like match your description that stole a car in this neighborhood. And I was like, okay, I'm driving from the church to my house. So no. <laughs> um, but you know, at that point I, you know, it's something I didn't really understand. And so I think from an economic standpoint, um, I think from the, from an economic standpoint, like a lot of people where I grew up didn't have a lot of money. Yeah. And so it didn't make me feel any good or bad about it. I think the times when it was weird was when I was going to magnet schools with like friends of mine now still that just had more money than me. Sure. Um, and it was little things I didn't really realize at that point. Like I remember like going home once after like doing a group project and my friend's dad drove us back. And I remember uh, we, I like I had, there was a brief period and we had a stepdad and he was working for one of my friend's dad's friends as like a courier or something. <laughs> And it was super embarrassing because I remember we're pulling up to my house and he's like, oh, I didn't know he worked for like Ted. Um, yeah, I'll tell him, put in a good word, give him a raise, just something like weird like that. Um, that just kind of kind of upsets the balance of, you know, you're at a school and generally, I think we might have had to wear uniforms. So we had like uniforms and your backpack can only be so fancy. So like how much money you had didn't really matter. But then when the outside world influence comes in, you realize that like, hey, we're not exactly the same. Mm. Um, <clears throat> but I think the bigger thing with creativity and cameras or any of the experiences my mom was focused on giving me was just like understanding that um, I'm not limited to maybe the reality of that, maybe that kid's dad or yeah. where I lived at the point at that point, or um, what was I going to say, or like anything that I couldn't imagine immediately. And so I think that was super, super valuable. And so since I ended up spending my time in so many different spaces, whether that was like, <clears throat> like in with a lot of Jamaican people or at this, the church I went to growing up is now like essentially a mega church as people would call it. Sure. Um, going to different magnet schools, um, going like playing saxophone, like doing all these things. Her, her whole goal I think was just to continually remind me that like there are things to be taken from each thing, positive and negative. And from there you have the ability to like start to understand what's around you. Mm. Um, and so I would say that the camera was just kind of a more of an embodiment of that. I, I, in no world would I escape the reality of how much my mom wanted, like, or not escape the reality of the framework my mom set for success. There's a book she used to read. She read when I was a kid. <laughs> I'll never forget it. It's called Understanding the Framework for Poverty. Mm. Um, she's a teacher, okay. and my mom who will read anything <laughs> and make me then understand all of it. <laughs> um, and the book it just talks about like, <clears throat> like factors that lead to poverty, whether it's redlining, um, and then how those factors lead to generational poverty. And the one thing I will say is being an immigrant from, 
Jamaica, like the mental state of a Caribbean American person who immigrated here in this generation versus an African American person who can't tell you where their family is from. Mm. There is something kind of tiny about that that can be very frustrating. Um, if you're an African American person that has been here for generations, um, you can trace yourself back to slavery. Um, and so my mom would always kind of talk to me about understanding the differences, but also understanding that regardless of anything, you're still black and you have to uh, understand where that places you on the social strata. Sure. And no amount of work you do is going to make you not black, but understanding that you shouldn't be striving to tie that in any way. Um, <clears throat> I, I, basically what I'm just trying to say is the camera is an embodiment of of a, like new of getting access to new places, but the work that I needed to do was still going to be present mm. throughout. Okay. Awesome. I, I appreciate you uh, sharing that. And, and I, again, like it's, it's one of those things that we've kind of walked through. It's just like how, how is this approached and how, do, how does that go about it? So no, that, that makes perfect sense. Um, I want to know, you know, kind of ch- switching gears. Like what is when you are, kind of now working and shooting and you know doing you know a lot of portraiture and stuff like that you know what is the i think i read somewhere that you're like you're trying to get the the truth that can be found in in portraiture so i want to know like what what does that mean uh in general and then like how are you uh effectively like doing that when it comes to you know shoot time or if you're taking a photo of a person um and how how do you make it so it's not just like hey can you take my picture really quick like what is what is the the andre thought process during that time hey folks want to come in here and thank our second partner that is photo booth supply co during wedding season and even right now i'm trying to explore new ways to get more money on the bookings that we already have. And for me, that has been using my Photo Booth Supply Co. photo booth. My photo booth is called the Salsa. It's a digital only selfie style, eco-friendly photo booth. It's all in one, super, super cool. I love it. The cool part too is that for most weddings, I don't even need an attendant. Like it's light enough that you can just add it to your trunk or in the back of an Uber if you're in a city. And I know plenty of photographers who even bring it to them with destination weddings. RIP travel. Uh, How cool is that, though? Uh, My favorite part of the salsa is that at every wedding, it's generating revenue for my business. So it's doing the marketing for me. For every photo, video, or GIF, or boomerang that it makes, it asks for an email or or a phone number, whatever you want to to have. And at the end of the wedding day, uh, you know, even during the wedding, it's emailed or texted people their content with your Instagram handle, with your call to action, whatever you want in there, if you want, without even seeming sleazy. And it's really, really cool. And so I love how much these guys just help you market because it's not, you want to make more money and you don't want to add something to your business and be like, oh, how is it, when is this going to be profitable? Like for me, it only took two weddings for it to be profitable. It was incredible. It's super affordable and they even have payment plans. So you don't have to save up to start making more money. You guys can start today. Head over to thebeardedtog.com slash booth and get your salsa photo booth and start making more money on every wedding today. That's thebeardedtog.com slash B-O-O-T-H. Huge thanks to Photo Booth Supply Co. for sponsoring our show. Uh, you try to make them slow down. And you try to have your subject know you're going to slow them down by asking them a good amount of questions before you even get to meet them. So if they reach out, I think the process starts with um, understanding what a person needs. Like I'm a big fan of asking a lot of questions. And so... Um, if someone like if you reached out and said, Hey, I need, I need some portraits. Um, like let's, let's run through a couple scenarios. You reach out to me, you reach out to me and say, you need portraits. Um, the first thing I'm going to ask you is what are they used for? Partially because I want to understand how to price it, but more importantly to understand like what you're looking for. If you want portraits of you that might be good for a dating profile, they might also still work for your headshots. They might also still work if you need a social media refresh, but they could be very different. Um, and the truth you're trying to pursue there is different than normal. Like sometimes these things overlap, sometimes they don't. The next thing I ask you is to try to put together like a mood board for me. Um, and it's really easy to do that now with Instagram on the saved feature because you can start, you can take images that you like, put them together, um, and you can have them saved. And it's like a really lovely way to um, start to figure out your visual language and identity. Um, so I think just going to the process being very intentional. So I tell people like, Hey, it's going to take a little bit of time. It's going to do a little, it's, we're going to have to do this much work. We need to be aware about this or ready for this or et cetera. Um, being able to show that level of care early people like generally, I feel like listen better. Um, a B, um, I think when I'm there, I really try to make sure that we slow things down. So, 
um, sometimes people need to change clothes and things like that for shoots. So like those are things that are going to have to be sped up, but, um, I don't like stacking shoots on each other. And also when I'm with the person, I like to show them the images and say like, Hey, like, um, your face is scrunched here or, you know, your, I, I try to like direct them and explain why throughout. So I want you to take another step back so that your body doesn't fill the edge, fill the edges of the frame, which will then make you seem larger. Um, if you, and then they're like, I want to see more imposing then I'll say, all right, we'll take it from a slightly lower angle. Or then we, we just kind of go through and help them understand how they're coming off because the clearer that that gets throughout when you shoot, um, then the more easily they can kind of pursue the thing that they want. So that's if you need to shoot. And then if it's a client, like for example, um, when I did that Walmart job, the directive was to get 20 vignettes um, of like American life happening in three cities in the South. So I did Nashville, Miami, and Birmingham. And so I treated this similarly to how I would like a journalism project when I was in college or when I was working for or interning at those papers. Um, I kind of wrote out areas and things that I wanted to shoot. So for me, I was really focused on an understanding that the other cities that they were having people shoot in for this commercial were probably going to have less people of color in them. So I was very focused on getting stories of people of color, but also in a way that didn't feel exploitative. So I wanted, when I was in Miami, I wanted people playing dominoes. I wanted not just people stereotypical, like lighter skinned Cubans, but just a ton of people playing dominoes. So it had to be in a public place. Um, and then when I'm there, I try to spend enough time that after I get the first couple shots I maybe want, I can sit and wait and watch and shoot again and again. Um, and sometimes I think that that truth you just get by revisiting the scene of the crime a bunch of times. Um, and so like really patience and articulation. And if you're like waiting for the decisive moment, if it's like an editorial thing, then you in theory have seen what that decisive moment looks like uh, without using your camera so that you can recognize it when you see it mm, i love and it just keeps getting better over time i love that i love that what do you got uh do you have any big things happening so far for 2020 or is everything kind of on hold right now big things dude i'm essentially a turtle <laughs> what, what are you talking about um yeah i mean like uh i had a big project that i'm still gonna do but we don't really know what's going on here um i can't Did a project last year with North Face when I went to Alaska and we're going to do something not similar, but in a, in a reasonable, in an adjacent lane uh, with them this year that was supposed to be very involved that I was really excited about. And now we can travel nowhere because everyone has everything everywhere. <laughs> so I guess right now what I'm trying to work on is like sitting down. Um, I, uh, I'm going to write an article with my friend Nick, who I made a music video with. Um, about like how to be resourceful, creative in the city you live um, for Adobe. That's going to come out soon that I'm actually pretty excited about that actually should be helpful for people. Um, I'm thinking about ways that I can learn things during this break. Like I think right around this time next week, all the like think work I think I still need to do should be done. And at that point we're going to start hitting that like, all right, so what next period? Yeah. And I think in that, um, there's an opportunity to like just learn some things. So um, <clears throat> probably go back and play with some videos that I've shot that I never really edited, um, organize some things out, do some research about lighting specifically. I think um, one thing I'm excited about is I'm going to have a little space um, in this apartment I'm going to move into that I'm going to be able to like I mean, pull some lights out for. And I just want to try some things that I haven't used before um, that I think will be kind of positive i think there the holes in my work there are many of them but one of them is just the ability to you know mix light on location and to create something that is <clears throat> uh maybe a little more stylized looking um and i'm just kind of curious to play around and kind of see what i can make in that process so um kind of interested in playing with more light and getting those things together doing some more video stuff. Um, I've really enjoyed the video that I've been working on in the last year or two. One of the goals, I, two goals I had last year was to just do more video, no excuses. So like a super eight project with Uber and my friend Ray, 
um, did like a mobile video for this brand called Feather for fun. Um, that a collaboration with my friend Natalie, and then uh, also to work with small businesses. And so this year, the start of the year, I did a, a Skillshare original with Skillshare about how to create for the small businesses businesses in your neighborhood, and that's going to come out soon, which should be pretty cool. Um, and basically, it's just about like taking the steps as a creator to um, taking the steps as a creator to deliver what the client needs, kind of like what I was talking about if I was taking your portrait um, and like getting more ingrained in your community to be a fixture, not as like a grammar, but as someone who can provide value for people that need it. That's awesome. I love that. That's like, uh, you know, there's so many people who want to get involved or like don't know how to become uh you know the guy or the gal or the whoever and just be like oh yeah like we have somebody who comes and shoots our menus but they are also like a part of our family and i know lots of photographers and creatives who have kind of like been integrated to these you know small businesses whether they be craftspeople or whatever and then especially right now it's like they're so thankful for that content and so thankful for those relationships because um uh, you know, it's, it's helping everybody right now. And, and, and I don't know, that's really cool. I think that's awesome. Uh, and I love Skillshare. So I think that's, that's awesome too. (laughs) Uh, well, cool, man. Where's the best place for people to go and see your work and say hi. And, uh, and yeah, I mean, I just love kind of following all the images that I see and, uh, you know, what dude, well, first of all, um, it's funny. I'm trying to like be more succinct, which is you're probably laughing at because I know you said you have to do some other interviews and some other work to do today. So I'm not trying to like drag this out. I know. Normally I'd be like, but, take your time. Um, <laughs> what would you say? I said, normally I'd be like, yeah, take your time. And I'm like, yeah, we're stacking them today. <laughs> I totally get that. Um, no, I mean, and also for everyone that is listening to this, please don't edit this out. Anyone that edits audio is a champion. I don't think people understand how difficult this is. In between sentences, you're going to hear like, <laughs> and then people being like, oh, the sauce and whoever. <laughs> and so the amount of work it takes to edit audio so it's coherent and not disgusting is admirable in itself. <laughs> like, I just, I can't stress this enough. Audio editing is incredibly difficult and takes a ton of time. So thank you for having me on your pod. Um, but on my end, you got to edit out that cough too. Uh, on my end, uh, you can find me on the internet. Um, thankfully, I, you know, when I was a little kid, I was like, why is my name under the U? But I'm very thankful for it now on the internet because it's very easy to find me. Yeah. Um, unless you're my FBI agent. So please don't find me if that's the case. Um, like this podcast, then I'll buy my own microphone and then I'll just get on this podcast for no reason when he didn't want me to. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, yeah, you can find me um, AUNDRE on Instagram or AUNDRE, L A R R O W on Twitter. Twitter, I will respond to you probably a lot quicker than Instagram because Instagram is just kind of be overwhelming and messages and comments disappear a lot easier. Um, but yeah, the thing I would say as a sign off is just keep like find the story that you have the most access to, tell it repeatedly, um, and just find new ways to appreciate that access because the access uh, allows you the ability to tell it better than anybody else can. Man, it just does not get any better than that. I love Andre, his story, and I remember seeing him up on the stage at workshop just sharing kind of his vision and perspective on things, and it's just been great to kind of follow him and see his connections and the things that, um, not just that he gets to shoot, but how he shoots them and like what he stands for, and I loved like the Walmart project and the North Face project that he did, so really, really cool. Go check him out. Say hi, of course. Uh, Favorite one, go join the Facebook group, togfb.com or thebeardedtalk.com. You can go find the link right there. Would love to have you guys. We're doing free trainings, free workshops in there. And then secondly, if you would love to help the show for free, definitely go leave us a five-star review in the Apple Podcast ecosystem. Would love that. Really helps the show. Have a wonderful day, guys. Thank you so much. Keep being awesome. Awesome.